morning, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, like I say, my name is David Harkin. I am the climate change scientist at Historic Environment Scotland. And my role is to, uh, or my role specific, sort of, yeah, specifically, is to understand the impacts of climate change, um, specifically on the properties that we look after, but with a sort of wider uh, remit to share that knowledge out to the wider sector so that other people can start to understand the impacts of climate change on our cultural heritage. Uh, yeah. uh, I think you've had quite a few presentations from HES folks, so you're probably sick of hearing who we are. Um, we are the lead public body for Scotland's historic environment. Our mission is to protect, conserve and manage the historic environment for the enjoyment, enrichment and benefit of everyone. Uh, we have 336 properties in our direct care and those are of national and international importance and associated with those properties is a collection of over 38,000 objects. Uh, that's the location of, uh, sorry, yeah. The, the red dots there are the location of all the properties that we look after, so it's a, a national remit. Those are the dots of the sites that have collections associated with them, so again, it's pretty extensive. I like this quote, this is the second sentence in the um, paragraph that we define who we are as an organisation in our corporate plan. So we are at the forefront of researching and understanding uh, the historic environment and addressing the impact of climate change on its future. So a, a, so a sort of sentence that alludes to the fact that we take this quite seriously. And I guess my, the very nature and being of my role, the fact that it exists, should indicate that as well. Uh, I like to start by sort of addressing why we do what we do and in simple terms that is that the climate of Scotland is changing and has already changed. So since the 1960s there has been a measurable change in the climate of Scotland. We have fewer days of frost, fewer days of snow, the growing season's longer, temperatures are around about one degree higher than they were. We get around about 20% more rain annually and sea level is rising at an ever increasing rate. And these are averages, so there's quite um, there's quite quite big extremes hidden within that, particularly within rainfall. So the Northwest Highlands of Scotland, for instance, there's some years where they are getting upwards of 70% more rain than they did even in the past 40 or 50 years. So it's, uh, it's extreme and it's happening. But the climate has always changed and will always change. What makes this different is the pace of change. So that's, that's why that's why it's important that we understand what these impacts are. Uh, the anticipated change going forward. Uh, so there's a, a fantastic resource called UKCP09, an online tool that lets us look at projected changes over various timescales in the future. Uh, so temperature, um, under a high emissions business as usual scenario, we're looking at almost a three degree rise in temperatures during the summer and just over two in the winter. Rainfall becomes a bit different. Winters get wetter, summers get drier, but the um, the way the rain falls changes essentially. So you get shorter, more intense periods of rain um, and the sort of extreme weather events that we get every now and then become increasingly normal. This year is a really good example actually. We went from a particularly cold March to one of the hottest summers we've ever had. So within a few months you're getting these wide extremes and wide changes. So all this has led HES to want to understand what the risk of climate change is on the properties that we look after. So we've undertaken the first phase of a climate change risk assessment on the properties in care. Um, I think it, it's good to point out actually that many of the sites that we look after are add much of the historic environment in general is on the front line of climate change, you could describe it as. And that's because of the, the landscapes in which these properties are situated. So if you take a, an example like Tintalan Castle, for instance, it's obvious why it's built on that really steep side promontory jutting out into the Firth of Thor, because it made it easier to defend. But that means it's at risk of potential uh, uh, collapse of the cliff here, coastal erosion, um, increasing sea levels will put increasing pressure on sites like that. Um, so we don't blame our ancestors for building in these vulnerable, vulnerable positions. They were, they were building there because they had to, essentially. So we have focused for the first part of this assessment on natural hazard risk. So that's things like uh, flooding, so coastal flooding, river flooding, pluvial flooding, groundwater flooding, 
coastal erosion and ground instability issues as well. So that's six different natural hazards that we had data sets or that we could access data sets for. It's a GIS based study. So these data sets were provided to us from organisations like the British Geological Survey, BGS, and SEPA, that's the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. And the BGS were actually a key partner in the project. Someone from the BGS sat on the project team and actually done most of the GIS work for us, because at the time we didn't have the capacity to have these data sets in-house, because they were pretty big. Uh, the reason for concentrating on natural hazard risk is quite simple, in that these hazards, the link with the climate is very, very clear in most cases. So I, I like to use this example to kind of demonstrate that. So what you're looking at here is uh, 2012, and it was the number of landslides that occurred and uh, the uh, rainfall totals, the average rainfall totals for each month. So what you should hopefully notice is that above average rainfall for the latter half of the year resulted in some sort of threshold being crossed and then the number of landslides occurred goes up dramatically. So the, the relationship is clear. Climate change alters the uh, occurrence rates and the severity of the hazards that we've studied. So the idea is that if a site is at high risk now from flooding, then we are assuming that the risk, um, it doesn't get any lower, if anything it gets worse going forward. So the methodology, so we uh, took spatial data related to our site. So this is Fort George and the polygon there is the extent of the land that we are, um, that we look after at that particular site. Um, the our spatial data is run through GIS and overlaid with the hazard data from the BGS and SEPA. And it spits out lots of spreadsheets full of numbers that we can then turn into something a bit more meaningful. So the numbers tell us what, what the likelihood of that event occurring at that particular site is. And the data sets vary a little bit in what they show. So this, the SEPA data sets had quantitative return periods for flooding. So a 1 in 10 flood, 1 in 100 year flood, and so on. Some of the data sets had more descriptive likelihoods. So, for instance, the ground instability or the landslide data set um, was an indication of how many, the, I think they call it causative factors occurring in one particular point that could lead to ground instability being an issue. So things like, what's the geology like? What's the, the angle of the slope? Why, how far below is the groundwater? Um, or where does the groundwater table come up to? Um, so yeah, the data set's a little bit different and trying combining that into one workable system was quite tricky. Um, but we assigned likelihood scores of one to five um, based on how likely we thought those hazards were to occur at a particular site. Then we had to assess the impact. So there's not really a quantitative way of assessing the impact on an estate that is made up of really quite different sites. So, so broadly speaking, you can actually break our portfolio of properties into thirds. So you have roofed monuments, some of which are still occupied. You have unroofed monuments with high masonry. And then you have field monuments, standing stones, the, the lumps and bumps in the ground is what they often get called. But so the results of this were at first quite alarming. Um, so the inherent risk score showed us that almost 90%, so that's very high and high risk over almost 90% of our properties were exposed to one or more of these hazards in a way that we thought was unacceptable. When we then took into account things like how often the sites are, um, uh, uh, how often can uh, the condition, how often sites are checked for their condition, so how, how often do people go and survey the sites, is the site staffed all year round, is it seasonal, um, what's the visitor access like to the site? We, took all this into account and then lowered the impact accordingly. So the, the idea behind that was that if a site is staffed all year round, that staff presence means that you can have a reactive response to the hazard rather than, uh, a, sorry, a proactive response to the hazard rather than a reactive response. So if someone's walking around the site all day, they're going to be able to pick up on the warning signs of a hazard potentially happening. Um, but that still left um, just over 53% of our sites at risk in a way that we thought was unacceptable. Um, stats and graphs are great, but the, the best way to show you how this has been useful is to actually give you some sort of examples on the ground. Um, so this is Duff House. Um, 
up um, in Banff, in the northeast of Scotland. That's the house sort of hiding in there. And this photo is from 2009 and shows you the extent of a flood that occurred back then. And that lines up really quite nicely with the extent of the one in 100 year flood there. So that's within 30 metres of the house itself. So Duff House holds a really important um, collection of uh, artworks and decorative furniture and sort of furnishings um, and whatnot. So flooding at a property like that uh, could be really quite catastrophic. Um, but what the data also helps us to assess is whether or not the, the places that are designated as safe places in the event of a um, issue happening at the property are also safe. So even in, if you think about um, so the salvage planning for the property. So it doesn't have to be a flood. A flood doesn't have to happen for the collections to have to get removed from the house. It could be anything. It could be pests, it could be fire, uh, anything like that. So we also use this data to assess whether the safe places are safe. And in the case of Duff House, it's the, um, it's the playing fields and there's a rugby club house uh, just there. That's the designated safe place for Duff House. So, and it's safe because it's out of reach of the floodwaters and there's still access to it. This is in Comartin Glen, so we have a sort of really quite a high density, um, high density of sites in quite a small area. And up until fairly recently, this was the access path into a few of the sites. Um, this site floods really quite regularly, or the access path does anyway. Uh, and they were replacing a few access points acro across small burns, um, but they took the opportunity to actually create a raised pathway, a raised boardwalk into that site. And then this is it doing its job. So access to the site is maintained despite a flood, and this is the sort of hazard map that goes along with it. So site up there, access is through here, and you can still get into the site. So. Having this data allows us to think about what sites are at risk and then what we can do to um, adapt to that risk, but also to mitigate the consequences of it if it does happen. Um, this example is a little bit different. Uh, who's been to Links of Notland? Yeah. Show of hands. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so over the past 10 years or so, the, um, this particular site has been at quite severe risk of it's not coastal erosion specifically, I believe it's wind erosion. Uh, so the, the dune system that protected Links of Notland, which is around about 11 or 12 Neolithic, it's a, new, well, a small, small Neolithic settlement that also has um, later Iron Age settlements in it as well. It lost its protective dune cover and uh, wind erosion exposed the site and was re resulting in uh, the, the sort of information this site retains being lost. So there's been a, a sort of prolonged period of excavation works at this site to try and gather in the data before the site was potentially lost forever. Um, and it's throwing up really important finds. So this is the Westry Wifey, which is apparently the earliest depiction, or the earliest artistic depiction of the human form found in the UK so far. A uh, really important find, but I actually think that the find on the left-hand side is more important because I found it. Uh, so I got to go, up, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm a fraud standing before you, but I got to go up, um, I got to go up last September um, to get some sort of, I guess it was like work experience, work experience within work, um, because it's, it's a topic that I have to write about a lot and as archaeologists, and I, I'm, I'm a geologist by trade, but you don't really appreciate what's going on until you see it firsthand. So I got to go up to the Lynx Milton dig and I got to work there for five days. I got given a midden heap to dig in, along, supervised along with uh, archaeology friends um, who helped me and much to their despair, at the end of day one, I found this, uh, and which they reliably inform me doesn't always happen. As an archaeologist, you can go weeks or months without finding anything. So I found this lovely 5,000 year old bone pin and I was the first person to hold it in 5,000 years and um, working in the intersection of climate change and cultural heritage, most people have a moment when, they, when there's a, a light bulb moment, so to speak, and this was the light bulb moment for me. Um, it sort of said to me, oh my God, we have such a unique perspective of time as an industry uh, that we have to use this information to help 
plan what happens going forward. And that's kind of similar to what the sort of keynote speaker was saying this morning. Um, knowing my audience, oh, well, I should say, I threw in some extra slides in case I had time, and I think I have time. Um, at the likes of Notland, um, HS and now HES have undertaken a, a project to try and stabilise the dune system and to encourage it to grow again, to offer that site a bit of protection. So that post marks the extent of the PIC area. So on this side, we're, we, we're not responsible for it, but on this side we are. And this is the, the replanted dune system that is actually looks like it's doing quite well and it's starting to build itself back up again and offer the site of protection that it's lost. Uh, and then knowing my audience today, I wanted to just to throw in something that's really cool. Uh, so our digital documentation team went up actually the week after I was up, so I was digging in that little tiny bit there. Uh, they went up the week after, scanned the site and then it just, it, it just gives you like a completely different perspective of the site. It really brings out the features of the site in a way that you don't always get through photography. Okay. Um, but recording it digitally creates a record that we now have in case something does happen to the site. Um, and th there's a point behind all this in that we can use the risk assessment data to identify sites that are at risk and then think about how we record them and manage them and make sure that if something does happen at them, then we have a record of them that can be used going forward because the site might not always might not always be there. This, the sea will take what the sea wants to take. It's an unstoppable force. So we have to make sure that we're sort of on the sort of leading edge, the first foot, to make sure that um, we're not reacting to stuff when it does happen. Uh, the next steps for the project, uh, we need to rerun the risk assessment, but uh, expand it out a little bit. So right now we're focused on the risk within the PIC boundaries themselves. A really useful exercise would be to think about the risk that's happening out with the property as well. So there might be access points. Some sites only have one access route in and out. So if, the, if that access route is affected by a hazard, um, so if it's susceptible to flooding or whatnot, then we need to know about that in order to manage that site properly. But right now that might not have been picked up because we've been sort of restricted to the PIC boundary itself. Um, the UK CPO9 data, which is the climate change projection data that I mentioned a little bit earlier on, they're updating that and it's actually due to come out at the end of this month. So we'll have UK CP18 data and those climate change projections will need to be built into the risk assessment to truly make it a climate change risk assessment. Uh, the Links of Notland example is a good example of why it's really important to go out to these sites firsthand and also to see what's happening on the ground. Um, and also to speak to the people that work at these sites day to day because they have a lot of information up here that just doesn't exist in data sets that we can analyse. And quite often that information is sort of crucially important. So they can tell you how often that little bit of ground floods and how bad it is. You know, have they, have they seen it getting worse? Or have they seen new bits of a site flood that haven't flooded before? And then also more in-depth sort of desk-based studies as well, so sort of diving into the archives and the records to see if we can um, to see if we can sort of improve our understanding of changing environmental conditions at the site. Because that the point I make about how we have a unique perspective of time. Uh, so many of our sites have experienced change in the past and will experience change again in the future. Um, so they can offer up perhaps. Um, ideas that can help prepare for climate change in a sort of more robust way. So as a sector, I think we have a really important role to play in achieving meaningful climate action. Uh, that was a whirlwind. Uh, the report from the first phase of the risk assessment is online, so you can download that and read at your leisure. Uh, we are in the process of developing a new climate change action plan that will sort of set out our work for the next five years, so starting next year. So watch out for that coming out as well. There's lots of great information in it, or there will be. Um, happy to answer any questions. Follow me on Twitter, where I post regularly. Uh, that's me.